contributions for quantum phases of matter, particularly fractionalized phases, topological order, and several such ideas. <clears throat> so to give a brief uh, introduction to Professor Subir Sajdev. So he actually did his um, undergraduate studies partly at IIT Delhi and then at Massachusetts Institute of Technology and went on to pursue his PhD at Harvard University. Um, after which he was briefly at the at and Bell Labs, which was a very popular place, although it's a, uh, one can say a telephone company, but it was very instrumental in research in the United States in all, all the way till early 90s, probably, uh, where he did his uh, research, independent research. And then he joined Yale University, uh, where he did many interesting works on quantum phase transition. And also, I think he, that, that's where he wrote his first book, Quantum Phase Transitions. And uh, thereafter, he moved to Harvard University, where he is Herschel Smith Professor uh, since 2005. Um, his career has been exemplary and lots of awards, and it's a very long list, but just to name a few, he's been recently been elected as the foreign member of the Royal Society. Um, he's been awarded many distinguished awards, such as the Dirac Medal, which is a very prestigious award in theoretical physics, as well as the <clears throat> Lars Onsanger uh, Prize from the American Physical Society. So these are just to name a few of his uh, awards. And as I said, the list of his achievements and contributions to condensed matter theory is very long and uh, prolific. And he's been particularly supportive about the uh, theoretical physics research and particularly condensed matter physics in India. And he's a wonderful teacher and has been training lots and lots of generations of students and postdocs. So it's a real honor to have Professor Subhi Sajdev here. And we look forward to your side. Okay, you're okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Darshan, uh, for that very kind introduction. I'm very happy to be here. And this is uh, a bit of an echo. Set, okay. Yeah. Very happy to be here at this uh, wonderful new institute and see all the new labs and all the bright young students. Thank you for your hospitality for the last few days. Okay. So uh, this is supposed to be a public lecture. So some of you may find it a bit too elementary, but hopefully there'll be some entertainment for you nevertheless, but uh, especially the people who are not physicists, I, hopefully there's a few here, uh, please don't hesitate to slow me down or ask questions, I'll pause a few times uh, as I go along. Okay, so uh, let me begin with, oops. Okay, this was working a few minutes ago, there we go. Oh boy, I think I have to select the screen here. Yeah. Right, there we go. All right, so I'm going to begin by actually listing uh, a few of the very important discoveries in physics from mostly from over 100 years ago in sort of chronological order, uh, just to give you a sense of the topics that we're thinking about today, uh, which are very much related to these great early discoveries. So the main theme here, as you'll see, uh, is a connection between phenomena at large scales, uh, like superconductors or black holes, which you can hold in your hand or, or see in astrophysical situations, to the microscopic, to the microscopic systems of matter, which are atoms and molecules and electrons. So let me begin by first entropy. What is entropy and temperature? Um, so the concept of entropy is really something that origins in thermodynamics. Uh, Clausius in 1865 formulated the second law of thermodynamics that every macroscopic system has an entropy which cannot decrease. Uh, in more practical terms, this is simply the statement that you cannot make perpetual motion machines. Excuse me for a minute. <laughs> so here there's a cartoon from The Simpsons. I don't know, I don't know if it's, it's familiar here. So his daughter has made a little perpetual machine here, but Homer Simpson is very aware of the laws of thermodynamics and he forbids her from, from doing it. All right, uh, so that was just an empirical statement of the fact that you can't make perpetual version machines. There was also the concept of temperature, which is something you measure with a thermometer. And in terms of temperature too, there is a concept of uh, second law of thermodynamics, it tells you that heat always flows from a hot body to a cold body and are not 
in the other direction. Okay, but really the fundamental connection to microscopic concerns of matter, in fact, the existence of molecules uh, was not, in, not certain in 1870. Excuse me a minute, I'm just a bit out of breath. I don't know why. Huh? Sorry? Yes, excuse me. <laughs> Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, so Boltzmann, this is his gravestone here in Vienna, uh, and it has this famous equation uh, written down, S equals K log W. So S here is entropy, and W is a concept that Boltzmann introduced. It's a concept of probability. He came up with the idea that everything around us is made up of atoms and molecules, and for a given microscopic situation, like the, uh, you know, the air in this room, in a given pressure and temperature, is a certain set of po possibilities of where all the molecules can be. And W was a measure of all of these possibilities. And so Boltzmann postulated that the entropy was related to the log of, of W. Okay, and then through the work of Clausius, you could then relate temperature as something mu much more absolute, not something that you measure in a thermometer, but something having to do with the rate of change of entropy uh, with energy. All right, so that's really all I want to say about entropy. It'll come back in the subsequent discussion. So now let's move on to conductors, uh, which is just another word for metals, uh, and superconductors. So here is a simple explanation. <laughs> so a conductor is the metal, it can conduct electricity. So what is a semiconductor? Well, I'm sure you've all seen semiconductors here in every iPhone. Uh, so they are conduct objects that conduct, do not conduct electricity well. And finally, there's superconductors. Well, that's not exactly Superman, but what is a superconductor? Well, a superconductor is an object that can conduct electricity without resistance. So here's an ordinary conductor like copper. Uh, and what happens in an ordinary conductor is that the electrons move through freely uh, they detach from the atoms, and they move freely, and mostly you can ignore the interactions between the electrons. So they're just moving independently of each other, and we have a well-developed theory for the motion of electrons in something like copper. Uh, all right, so then how do you get superconductivity? Well, superconductivity was discovered in 1911 uh, by Camel Leonis. Uh, what he did built was a very good refrigerator, and he managed to cool mercury down to minus 269 degrees centigrade, which is about four degrees Kelvin, and notice that it, uh, it carries electricity with essentially zero resistance. Okay, so since that opened the field of superconductivity that we've been studying on now for over a hundred years, uh, and there's still many open questions in the field of superconductivity. So for example, there's these family of superconductors called the cuprate high temperature superconductors, that were discovered in 1986. Uh, so these have the property that they can go superconducting at much higher temperatures. And so they're called the high temperature superconductors. Uh, so in fact, you can just put them in liquid nitrogen in a little experiment you can do on a tabletop. And this, this little piece of YBCO, as we call it, uh, goes superconducting. So in fact, I have here a video made by the sister of our illustrious former director of TIFR. And then they need to ready. Uh, so here's a little piece of YBCO, which she has dipped into liquid nitrogen. And these are a bunch of magnets sitting here on a track. Uh, and so it's floating above. And in fact, you can give it a push. Uh, and it's the ability of this little piece of YBCO to conduct electricity without resistance that allows it to float uh, without uh, easily above this set of magnets. Uh, eventually, of course, it heated up. It's no longer cold enough, and it stops being a superconductor. So, so that's one potential use of superconductivity uh, is to is to create high magnetic fields. And in fact, the latest MRI machines are made up of of, uh, of superconducting material. Uh, but probably the most promising use of superconductivity uh, is is something that hopefully in the future. So this is a company in, in Boston called Commonwealth Fusion Systems, 
with billions of dollars of startup capital and they're using HTS magnets, meaning high temperature superconductivity magnets. Oops. Uh, here. So high temperature superconductivity magnets are the enabling technology. So here's the hard part is making wires of this material. The material I showed you was a piece of ceramic. The, the, the technology that has to be developed is to take the ceramic uh, and make it into wires. Uh, and so then you are able to create much stronger magnetic fields that you can create with ordinary magnets made of copper wire. Uh, you have to cool it, but that's really not the big expense. The, 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 the difficulties have to really a question of making the wire stable and be able to withstand uh, you know, all that's happening in here. So in here, you have a very hot plasma of electrons and protons and various other particles, which presumably will fuse to, uh, to create energy. So this is, at this point, many people consider the most promising uh, way of getting fusion energy. Um, and so, you know, this is the, could be a path to a green future. Uh, well, uh, and so if any of this, even small fraction of this comes true, uh, all the work that many of us, including me, have spent on these high temperature superconductors would have been worth it. So if you ask me, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? Well, this is something that, uh, but mostly because it's interesting, uh, but there could even be some practical applications. Uh, so here's what we call the phase diagram of YBCO. Uh, on the horizontal axis, we have the electron concentration. So there's electrons that move in these planes of copper and oxygen, uh, and this vertical axis is temperature. Uh, so as a function of electron density and temperature, uh, it forms various phases. The superconductivity is here. And you notice the highest temperature for superconductivity is about 100 Kelvin, which is the uh, much higher than Camerley Onus. Camerley Onus was four Kelvin, which is way down here, uh, and and higher than the boiling point of liquid nitrogen. Uh, so, so the, the experiments you were seeing were presumably done in this regime. So, one of the big questions this phase diagram opened up in 1986. Uh, you know, the, the big question is why is this temperature so high? Why is it that this particular material and, and since then, there have been many others in the same family uh, which have such a high temperature superconductivity. Now, you know, like I said, in something like copper, where we understand how electricity flows, we can predict from first principles all kinds of things about copper, all its resistivity, its thermal conductivity, you know, when it would melt. All of these things can be computed by just doing the theory of the electrons moving in copper. But for this material, uh, that task has turned out to be extremely difficult. And we're still a long way of being able to predict uh, what TC is for this family of computons. And, and that's very important because someday we would like this TC to go up to room temperature, which is way up here, 270 or 300 Kelvin. Uh, and, and, you know, surely some fundamental understanding of theory will hopefully be important uh, in being able to achieve that task. So what we have been focusing on, uh, in particular, you know, as you raise the temperature here, is to ask, well, what's actually going on at higher temperatures? So what you find is that if you look over here, where TC is small, uh, you get an ordinary metal, just like copper. Uh, but if you look right here, for want of a better word, we call this regime a strange metal because of a lot of strange properties. Uh, and I think there's general agreement that these strange properties are due to a phenomenon of quantum entanglement, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, so really, that's the open questions in this field of superconductivity, which was born in 1911, uh, has left for us, which is how do you understand uh, this strange metal? Uh, just to give you an example, one of the strange properties is that if you look at the resistivity uh, of this material as a function of temperature, it's a linear function of temperature. Well, you would think that linear is the easiest function to describe, uh, but no, because in copper it's not linear, uh, and uh, at least in this regime. Uh, and there's, you know, we think we're starting to get some theories of this linearity, and these are intimately connected to quantum entanglement, which I'll get to in a minute. All right. Okay, so that's topic number two. So I introduce you to entropy. Uh, and Boltzmann and the idea of uh, 
just measuring the possibilities of uh, atoms or molecules or electrons to get an estimate of entropy. Uh, then I talked about superconductivity, a field born in 1911, which has opened up you know, a whole vista of problems that we're still working on and which potentially had many important practical applications. Uh, now I'm going to change gears completely uh, for mysterious reasons, but hopefully by the end of my lecture, you will appreciate why I'm talking about such different things. Uh, so these are black holes. So what are black holes? Uh, well, black holes uh, really is one of the triumphs of theoretical physics. Uh, where they were introduced into physics in 1916 by Carl Schwarzschild, who died soon after in World War I, uh, who was examining a uh, then very new theory of gravitation that had been proposed by Einstein. And he found a solution uh, which had these remarkable properties. So what you do is you take any mass, mass M here, of, you know, you put any mass you want, uh, and you convert the mass M to a radius. This is sometimes called the Schwarzschild radius. So you multiply it by Newton's constant G and divide it by the velocity of light squared. So that gives you a distance. And so every mass M, there's a radius. And so what Schwarzschild said was that if you took a mass M and you compressed it, so that all of it was inside the radius R, then you get a black hole. And that mass would be so dense uh, that even light cannot escape. So once, you know, there is some mass in here, but any light or any mass or anything emitted by uh, the matter inside the black hole is never going to leave the horizon. Uh, that was the prediction of Einstein's theory of gravity. Okay, so that seemed like a property of the gra gravitational theory, uh, but for the longest time, people never took it very seriously. Uh, you know, for example, you know, just to get an appreciation of what the Schwarzschild radius is. If you take the entire Earth, if you put M equals the mass of the Earth, the Schwarzschild radius is nine millimeters. So you have to compress the Earth the size of a pea before it's going to form a black hole. So that sounds like uh, an impossibly impossible task to achieve. Uh, but nevertheless, let's keep going ahead. In fact, it's even worse than that. If you looked at the equations of gravity, so the, the you know, gravity attracts, that's what Newton taught us. And Einstein's equation then, which are extensions of Newton's equations, showed that you get the black hole. Uh, so once the matter is inside the horizon, it's still attractive. So it's in fact going to, it's going to become even smaller than a P. In fact, as far as we can tell it, in Einstein's equations, uh, it, it goes to a singularity at the center of the black hole, and you have infinite density. And no one likes infinities in physics because, well, that means you, you're facing something that you don't understand. And so probably this is just an artifact and nothing to do with the real world. Uh, yeah, so the singularity convinced many that black holes were unphysical solutions of Einstein's equations and did not exist in our universe. Okay, but we now we know they do. In fact, they're everywhere. Uh, they were only discovered starting in the 90s. Uh, long after Einstein and, uh, and Schwarzschild have passed away. Uh, and in fact, there's one, as far as we know, at the center of every galaxy. Uh, there's one at the center of the Milky Way. Uh, and these are very big black holes. They're, these are called supermassive black holes, which have about four point, in this case, 4.3 million solar masses. Uh, you can get even bigger, but there are also smaller black holes of the order of a sun's mass, so they're of course much harder to see. Uh, and the LIGO Observatory, so one of which is being built in, uh, in, uh, in India, it will be designed to detect such black holes. So this black hole has a radius that's quite big. It's of, uh, about the size of the Earth's orbit around the sun. And that's because it's so heavy. It's 4.3 billion masses. Uh, and it's sitting at the center of our galaxy. Uh, there's no doubt about it at this point. Uh, okay. So there are black holes everywhere, uh, and this is a pure theoretical prediction which has turned out to be remarkably true. All right. Uh, okay, but then there's this whole this problem of singularity. So in the meantime, after Einstein's theory of gravity, we have the development of the quantum theory. The quantum theory was a theory of the hydrogen atom and how electrons move 
in a single atom. Uh, so when things get so small, in fact, when you get to the singularity, everyone thought, well, to really understand what's inside a black hole, uh, we have to do a the quantum theory. Now, we don't have a complete quantum theory of what's happening inside a black hole today, but there's been enormous amount of progress, uh, and I'll try to give you a little sense of that uh, towards the end of this talk. Uh, but the first person to really decide, you know, to realize that there were some highly non-trivial quantum effects uh, in black holes uh, was Stephen Hawking. So this is a view of his gravestone uh, in Westminster Abbey. Uh, I went this summer and wanted to see it, but the line was too long. Anyway, I got the picture of uh, Wikipedia, uh, and it has this famous equation, uh, which I've written out here. And it says, uh, here lies what, uh, sorry, I can't read it anymore. Yeah, what was model of Stephen Hawking? <laughs> uh, maybe he wrote that, I don't know. Uh, so here, the, this is, the, it has a temperature. Temp so in fact, Hawking said, this discovered that every black hole has a temperature. Uh, and this temperature is again related to the same quantities I've already introduced. Uh, there's Planck's constant. Well, okay, I haven't introduced that the velocity of light, Newton's constant, the mass of the black hole, and Kv is Boltzmann constant, which had previously appeared in a discussion of entropy. Uh, and that was related to the gas constant in PV equals nRT, which you, which you know about. Anyway, so Hawking made this prediction that every black hole uh, had a temperature uh, and an entropy. And I'm gonna to try to give you a sense of why that is the case as we go along. Uh, and, and the amazing thing is that Hawking was able to make this prediction without knowing what's inside a black hole. He, 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 he realized that you just look outside a black hole, you could still see some remnant of the quantum effects that's surely important to what's happening inside a black hole. Uh, all right. Okay, so we'll get to that. All right, so that's topic number three. Uh, so I've told you about black holes uh, discovered in, in 1911 for which there are really important problems uh, that are still open. I told you about superconductivity, for which again, there are very important key questions that remain open today. Uh, so what is the solution to everything? Uh, well, I'm going to propose it's quantum entanglement. So what, what we're going to, uh, which are not just me, I think many of us now believe uh, that what we need to, make, to do to make progress in these very important problems in physics is understand quantum entanglement better, uh, and especially quantum entanglement on very large scales with millions or billions of particles. Okay. It's also important for quantum computing, uh, but there you're talking about entanglement that you very carefully control uh, in a lab. Uh, whereas here, my discussion is about quantum entanglement, as my title says, as it appears in nature. All right, so then I have to introduce quantum mechanics. So I'm going to give you a lightning introduction to quantum mechanics over the next five minutes. Uh, so I presume you've all heard about Schrodinger's famous cat, which is both dead and alive. Uh, yeah, so here the person is saying, I have good news and bad news about your cat. Okay, well, that's the basic idea. Once you know and understand that, the rest is easy. Uh, but more precisely, what this is introducing is a remarkable new idea that didn't exist in physics before then, uh, which didn't exist at all in the Newtonian theory of the universe or the Einstein theory of the universe. These are what we call classical theories. But now we have quantum theories, uh, which has an entirely new principle, which is exactly the principle in this cartoon, that something can be, a cat can be both alive and dead. Of course, well, that's a bit fanciful because that's only true if the cat is completely isolated from the rest of the universe. But if it's isolated from the rest of the universe, it can't breathe, so it's definitely dead. So, <laughs> so don't worry about the pure, poor cat. Uh, but you could imagine you know, more microscopic uh, degrees of freedom, which can be, so to speak, two places at the same time, or what we call the principle of superposition. As any physical system can be a superposition of two or more distinct states. So this is something that people were forced to 
by an understanding of the, uh, the, the electronic structure of simple simple atoms. Uh, but really, the, there was a two to force experiment, two to force experiments called the double spill experiment, uh, which convinced everybody this was right. So this is kind of a view of what's happening. You're sending an electron out from from this electron source. And each electron, we are told in quantum mechanics, uh, is a wave. So it really looks like there's a wave that's going through uh, these two slits. But if you have a detector on the screen here, a single electron comes in like a particle. It gives you a blip on your detector at one point. Uh, and then you keep doing sending more and more electrons. And as you send more and more electrons, which seem to behave like waves, uh, they each are detected as a particle, uh, and only after you've seen a lot of them, you get what's called this interference pattern, which you could understand that the smooth interference pattern, you could understand perfectly uh, by the wave picture. So, so there's a so-called wave-particle duality. Uh, the electron comes in, each individual electron comes in like a particle, uh, but when you average over many of them, it looked like it was a wave. All right, so those are rather imprecise words. Uh, the more precise way of saying it uh, is what we, the way we say it is the principle of superposition. So we think of the LH electron as two possible states. One state is the left state, the other state is the right state. Uh, and the actual state of the electron as it's going through the system, but before you detect it, uh, is L plus R. Now, you know, this might bother you a lot, because who cares about what the electron was doing when you didn't detect it? Well, if you couldn't see it, it's a more philosophical concept. But uh, there are many more sophisticated experiments you can design uh, that actually are sensitive uh, to this fact. Uh, and, and in fact, this is the correct physical interpretation as far as anybody can tell. All right, so that's superposition, and that's my rapid introduction to quantum mechanics. And so now I can talk about quantum entanglement. So I think we can all, I think we agree we can trace back the idea of quantum entanglement uh, to this remarkable paper by Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen in 1935, which was titled, Can Quantum Mechanical Description of Physical Reality Be Considered Complete? And, and you can, if you read the paper, you can guess that Einstein's answer was no. Uh, that means it's not. There's something unacceptable about this principle of superposition. Now, okay, you know, Einstein said, okay, I believe everything you're telling me about this double slit experiment, uh, but now let me imagine an even more complicated experiment. And you surely have to agree that's impossible. So what is the experiment, this thought experiment that was proposed in this paper? Uh, so this is the following experiment. Now you take not just one electron, but you take two electrons. So for example, in a hydrogen molecule, there are two electrons. Uh, so there's the electron in one atom and the electron in the other atom. And here, let me just focus on their spin. So each electron can have two spin states, so just label by up or down. Uh, and so there's one configuration in a hydrogen atom where the electrons are this way, and the, there's the other one where they're this way. Uh, so quantum mechanics, if you work it out for a hydrogen atom, tells you, you know, that the answer is both. It's a superposition of this and this. That's superposition is allowed uh, in quantum mechanics. All right, so Einstein said, okay, fine, I believe that, but here's an experiment. Suppose I could take these two electrons um, and separate them without disturbing their spin. Uh, that's a very difficult experiment even today, but we can do it with photons. In fact, it's done regularly now. Uh, but let me just talk about electrons. So we separate them and say one of them is here in Hyderabad and the other was in Bangalore on the other campus of TIFR. And it, as long as you separate them carefully enough, they are still in the superposition state. That is, they're both this way and that way. That's the prediction. Okay, so, so that's what quantum mechanics says that uh, uh, they're still entangled. That's the modern word. The word entanglement was never in this paper. But that's what we'll say today. So they're still entangled. Uh, and what this means is that uh, if I now take this electron uh, that's with me here in Hyderabad, and I happen to see it to be down, then at that instant only, uh, 
the other electron in, in, uh, in Mumbai is up. After my, so in, by my measurement, I have seen the blip of my electron and it's down. So the blip of the other electron has to be up. Uh, and it's, so that's the statement that somehow uh, there's something highly non-local going on uh, in quantum mechanics. Uh, and uh, so only when I measure this thing up, down, that's up. And conversely, when this is down, up and that's down. So this seemed, you know, completely unacceptable to, quantum, to, to Einstein. He didn't come out and say it in this paper as explicitly. Uh, but later on, in a letter uh, that I discovered recently that he wrote to Max Born in 1947, where, okay, I don't know if there's any German speakers in the audience, Spukhafte uh, Ferner, whatever. This, this is the English translation. Uh, I cannot seriously believe in it, meaning quantum mechanics, because the theory cannot be reconciled with the idea that physics should represent a reality in time and space free from spooky actions at a distance. So this is the spooky action at a distance, uh, is how we refer to it today, uh, that measurements uh, in one place can in principle fully determine measurements somewhere else. Uh, it, practically instantaneously. And of course, Einstein said, nothing can travel faster than the velocity of light. So how could this possibly be true? Well, the answer is it is definitely true. And, uh, and what was wrong with Einstein's reasoning? I think that the thing we, is actually nothing non local about the system. Uh, but what we have to now accept is the idea of a quantum state uh, is not local. So these two electrons interacted in the past. In the past, they were next to each other, they interacted locally, and they created a quantum state. And then when you separated them, you, you separated them in a way that the state was not disturbed. So the state was still there. So the state is neither here nor there. It's, it's almost a philosophical concept, but it's really a physics idea that you cannot pin down the state, but any physical effects are certainly very local. So for example, here, if I measure this electron and I see it's up, uh, so I know that my friend in Mumbai has an electron that's down, but I don't really know that for sure. I have to call my friend in Mumbai and confirm that's the case. And that it's only then that some information has propagated. And that certainly goes slower than the velocity of light. Anyway, that's kind of how we reconcile this very bizarre property. <laughs> of course, you know, we... we if this is science, not philosophy, you may not like the philosophy of quantum mechanics. In the end, uh, it's experiments that decide. Uh, and today, that kind of experiment we've done thousands or millions of times over very long distances. Uh, this is one of the early experiments in 2015, where I, the New York Times declared spooky action is real. So that must be true. Uh, and there was an experiment uh, here, in this case in the Netherlands, Ex almost exactly the type that Einstein described, uh, but with, with light, not with electrons. And light has different polarizations. And so when you have a molecule emitting two photons of light, they have to be in opposite polarization. So it's a very analogous type of experiment. All right, so I'm pretty much done with my introduction of, to all of physics you need to know. Uh, so let me quickly review. Uh, the idea here is to relate the macroscopic to the microscopic. This was first done in 1870 by Boltzmann when he introduced the idea of entropy. Uh, and then we looked at two macroscopic systems, which are superconductivity and black holes, uh, discovered a long time ago, but for which there are very serious problems in their microscopic description. Uh, and we are not able even today to, to fully understand. It. Uh, and what I'm claiming is that this idea of quantum entanglement uh, introduced by EPR in 1935, it holds the keys to this puzzle. So in the remainder, I'm going to try to tell you a little bit more about these more modern developments. Uh, but anyway, maybe this is a good point to stop for questions. Any quick questions, any burning questions anybody has? All right, so everyone is with me. Everything is completely clear, right? Yes, please. <laughs>
Uh, thank you, Professor. Thanks for uh, this background. Very helpful. I, I think uh, the spooky action is when he also made a statement that the god does not play dice. That's when uh, uh, Einstein... Be, I don't know. Thank you, so much. I, that, I, if you know exactly where he said it, I'd love to know. Right. I never believed that spooky action. I said that was just somebody made up, but he actually said it. Yeah, nevertheless, <laughs> in terms of uh, what I wanted to know is in terms of ever since we discovered the principle of quantum entanglement, yeah. how has it been applied in the real world? You know, there's been some research off late wherein people are looking at, can you use quantum technologies or quantum science mm -hmm. to deflect the tornadoes, deflect the cyclones? You could possibly neutralize the impact of a cyclone or possibly neutralize the impact of a tornado. Uh, uh, one is I haven't one... heard that. No, I'm, I mean, quantum technology is a very, very uh, big word. Uh, it encompasses many, many, many things. Uh, entanglement itself is a little more subtle concept. Uh, it's it's important for the things I'm going to describe soon. Uh, it's also important for quantum computing, and it's also important in quantum cryptography. Uh, that's also built on the principle of entanglement. But have we seen any right. practical implications, practical applications so far? Well, it's hard to say. I mean, I think, you know, like all of science, there's going to be many unexpected uh, benefits, uh, I hope. I've given you what I think are the most interesting to me, like superconductivity. Uh, black holes, well, they just, you know, who knows? <laughs> yeah. But I think it is fair to say that there's been enormous progress in just understanding the nature of quantum entanglement, just by studying them, studying it in such an extreme situation as a black hole. Uh, and that's really changed the viewpoint of the entire yes. physics community and, and even people who are not interested in black holes. So uh, alone is enough reason okay. to study them. Okay, thank you. Maybe somebody in there yeah, can answer. I have, no, I have a question. Um, okay. Actually, the thing is that when Einstein said this, yes. um, he he said it with uh, reference to special relativity, but the this one yeah no, the, no. no. This, but this. the superposition state we use is like from Schrodinger equation. So I I've got a doubt about that because you well, know, on the one hand a, yeah yeah you're right. I mean there is an implicit representation of special relativity yeah because special relativity forbids action at a distance. Exactly. So when he says it's spooky, he really means it doesn't agree with my theory. Uh, but in fact, it does. And that's what we understand today. Yeah. Uh, because he had misinterpreted uh, our, what quantum mechanics was saying. That's, okay. So but he was implicitly referring to special relativity because it, anything that goes faster than the speed of light was spooky. But all the time when we use this, we yeah. use uh, Schrodinger wave equation and uh, mostly in entanglement, we just use the. Well, you can also yeah. use the relativistic you, equation. But one that. doesn't usually, right? I mean, one well, usually just. Do. Uses, but uh, anyway, in black holes, one would, but otherwise. Okay. Uh, All right, I think I'm going to move on then. So let's get to something more current. So hopefully, I've convinced you. Uh, well, to make progress, we need to understand quantum entanglement, not just of two particles, the way. EPR proposed, uh, but of really an infinite number of particles. Uh, and nothing in physics is more useful uh, than having a simple model. You need a simple model of something that has uh, lots and lots of entanglement, uh, where the entanglement is really crucial to determine the physical properties, uh, of course. And I'm going to introduce a model, which happens to be named after me, so that's why I like it. So <laughs> that's my key model of many particle entanglement. Uh, but before I get there, uh, let's go slowly. In fact, the idea of entanglement of more than two particles uh, goes even further back than Boltzmann uh, to a chemist called Kekulé. Uh, and Kekulé came up, this was even before people really knew there were electrons and so on. But chemists knew a lot about chemical bonding. Uh, and he came up with a solution for the uh, the bonding structure of benzene. So chemist, benzene is a uh, molecule of uh, six carbon atoms and six hydrogen atoms, which are not shown. Uh, and uh, the, they knew it had, the carbon atoms had to have three double bonds. Uh, today we say, well, there are these some extra electrons 
uh, on these carbon atoms, and they form this famous EPR pair. They're entangled just like in a hydrogen molecule or in the thought experiment of Einstein, Potosky, and Rosen. So, so pairs of electrons are entangled with each other, uh, and there's kind of a monogamy of entanglement. So each electron can only entangle with one other electron, uh, and so they form this EPR pair here, or EPR pair here, or here. Now, the trouble with this solution, the chemical structure of benzene, uh, is that it's not a perfect hexagon. If this is what it did, the chemical would not be a perfect hexagon. Those bonds would become shorter, maybe. Maybe a distorted hexagon. Uh, but I, I'm not sure it's the history of this, but chemists were pretty sure it had to be a perfect hexagon. So there's another possibility, which is, of course, this one. And quantum mechanics says, well, it's simple, it's both. Uh, so that was Kekulé's proposal. Uh, his words were it was sort of it was resonating uh, between uh, these two configurations of benzene. Of, uh, of forming entangled pairs. So he had in fact proposed uh, entanglement of six electrons. Uh, and the way it proceeds in a sort of a hierarchical way, uh, you entangle them in pairs and then you entangle the pairs. Uh, and like he said here, uh, he discovered this uh, having a daydream of a snake seizing its own tail. Uh, this is true, according to Wikipedia. Uh, so I can say that I had a dream, uh, not about snakes seizing their own tail, but snakes going here and there and everywhere. Okay, so that's a quick summary of what's called the SYK model. Uh, and yes, it, this is a made up story. <laughs> so what is the SYK model? Uh, so here's a simple model. It was uh, something I proposed with my first graduate student, Dean Gay. And this is K, who came on the scene a bit much later uh, and, and really explained many of the key properties. Okay, so uh, imagine you have uh, 16 or 18 sites here where electrons would sit. So you take, uh, you take these sites, so these are some nuclei, say, of positions in a crystal, uh, and you occupy some of them with electrons. Uh, now, electrons you know, like to move around, Quantum mechanics, that by the uncertainty principles, said these electrons should all be moving around. Uh, and for every motion of an electron, you have a certain what's called a, a quantum mechanical amplitude. You associate each motion with a with some kind of complex number. Uh, so here, uh, so in the SYK model, what we said was, okay, uh, we're not going to allow every electron to move because uh, then it becomes like copper, and they'll just move around and it'll be an ordinary conductor. Uh, but we are going to restrict them. And we're going to restrict them to just move in pairs. So for example, electrons on site 11 and 12 could move site 5 to 14. So in quantum mechanics, you know, anything that can happen does happen, uh, but you have to give associate with each such process a number, a complex number in general, uh, which I'll call this number U with these indices. So associated with this process is a complex number. Uh, and then every other process you can imagine, and you give each such process a complex number. So in quantum mechanics, you would then say the actual state of the system is all of these processes happening in parallel all the time. The, the actual state of the electron is now the sum with some weights of all these configurations. And the number of such configurations is huge. You know, uh, it grows exponentially with the number of electrons. So even with 100 electrons, it's larger than the biggest memory of any computer. Uh, and the actual state is the sum of all of these uh, configurations. All right, so to then figure out the state, uh, uh, you know, what I have to give you is these relatively small number of amplitudes or numbers. And then, well, uh, you need a very, very powerful computer to figure out what's going on. Uh, so the power of the SYK model is we said, well, actually, if I just assume these numbers are random numbers, they're drawn from some distribution, they're all independent random numbers. Uh, even in a big atom, you know, you, you can get a list of these numbers for a big atom. They look quite random. Uh, and in fact, now we can show that with probability one, almost any set of such numbers is in the class of uh, these random numbers. Uh, what we showed is that we could solve for the entangled state of all of these electrons 
uh, as long as these numbers were independent random numbers. Uh, okay. So, and if you want to learn more about this, there's some lectures on YouTube you can watch. <laughs> but anyway, so that's the SYK model is all I want to say about it. Uh, it's a solvable model, meaning we can really figure out what's going on in a situation where there's really highly non-trivial quantum entanglement. Uh, and so now we can ask questions about this metal, this, this object. How does it respond to a voltage? How does it carry current? Now, if you ask that question about copper, you would say, well, that the electron is just moving on their own, and each electron is carrying charge E, and that's how current flows in a copper wire. Uh, but in a wire made up of this SYK type model, uh, in fact, that's not true. You can't even see the individual electron entangled with everybody else. So for want of a better word, there's, an there's a soup, quantum soup of these electrons. And it's that collective motion of the quantum soup is what carries current. All right, so that's the picture uh, which helped explain a lot of things uh, and you know, for which we're making progress in just understanding the far more bigger problem of entanglement of many particles. Uh, so, for example, so I'm, I'm going to end by uh, applying this model. I have about 10 minutes, is that correct? Uh, to superconductivity first uh, and then to black holes. Uh, the amazing thing, and that's maybe my good fortune, this little very simple model somehow seems to connect to both fields. So, there is, and what this teaches us is something physical, I think, uh, that there's something similar. To, in the nature of entanglement in a, in a superconductor under certain conditions and certain black holes. Uh, something you know, nobody could have imagined uh, even a few years back. Okay, so let's go to this, uh, uh, go back to yttrium there and copper oxide, and now let me dive in a little bit and try to say just a little bit about what the electrons are actually doing. Uh, so let's begin here. Uh, which is called the a a AF, meaning anti-ferromagnetic insulator. So this is a regime where the density of mobile electrons is essentially zero. Uh, and you only have to look at the electrons on certain copper atoms. If you take these copper atoms here and lay them out, they form a perfect square lattice in this material. And if you look at the electrons, the important electrons on those copper atoms, they form this checkerboard arrangement, which is called an anti-ferromagnet. So it's like a ferromagnet, a ferromagnet like iron, the electrons are all, have their spins parallel to each other. That's what's responsible for its magnetic properties. Uh, but in this material, the copper atoms, uh, the spins are like the squares of a chessboard. Half of them are up and half of them are down. Uh, that's what we call an anti-ferromagnet. Uh, it's much harder to detect. You have to do some uh, scattering experiments. Uh, to really see this, but it's definitely the case that they do this. All right, but we're not interested in the insulator. We want to go from the insulator to the strange metal of the superconductor. Uh, and so what happens to this antiferromagnet uh, when you change the electron density? Uh, the short answer is we don't know, and there's literally a thousand of papers written on this problem. But I'll try to just give you a few pictures uh, which give you the general idea of what uh, many people think is going on. So one very important concept uh, is when you dope is the idea of a spin liquid uh, that was introduced by Anderson in 1973. Uh, and this is just pretty much the idea of a uh, for benzene uh, just ramped up. So these electrons on copper can also form uh, these EPR pairs. And there's many different ways of forming EPR pairs. Uh, and just like Kekulé, Anderson said, well, maybe they, they are resonating in exactly the same way as benzene. The difference being in benzene, there are only two configurations. Here, there's an exponentially large number of configurations. Uh, and it's a superposition of all of them. So this is a, one of the earliest states which had this entanglement on a really grand scale. But it's a very regular type of entanglement of just nearest neighbor pairs. Uh, so now, when you change the electron density, you lose a few of them. And superconductivity, we believe, has to do with these pairs of electrons, uh, you know, moving together. And they, they undergo a process called Bose condensation. 
proposed by S. N. Bose in 1924 in a different context, uh, and and that's what uh, actually Bose introduced Bose statistics of Einstein who figured out Bose condensation. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, and that roughly that's what's going on here. But what about the strange metal? Well, the strange metal appears uh, when the entanglement gets more complicated, uh, but it's not so regular. Uh, and there's uh, you know, entanglement with impurities, with longer range bonds, and so on. So all of this is going on in the strange metal. Uh, and the solvable model of entanglement uh, in the SYK model is helping us understand the physical properties of this entangled mess of electrons. Okay, uh, I think that's all I'm going to say about superconductivity then. Uh, all right, so to conclude the last topic, to bring everything together, uh, what about black holes? What, what, do quantum, what does quantum entanglement have to do with black holes? So, so this, for this, I have to go back to the idea of Hawking, where Hawking introduced uh, the fact that Hawking, that black holes have a temperature and even an entropy. So how do we understand that? Well, again, we take our famous EPR pair, which has been active in everything I've talked about, and I'm going to separate them not between Hyderabad and Mumbai, uh, but between the inside and outside of the black hole. Suppose this happened. Uh, and, you know, quantum mechanically, it must happen if it could happen, at, at least at some rate. Uh, so here's a black hole, and this poor electron has crossed the horizon. Uh, it may not know it yet, because there's nothing, there's no flag at the horizon saying you're crossing a horizon. It's just, you're just falling. You just don't know, but your fate has been determined. You're never going to get out. Uh, and so this poor electron is going to crash to the center and be compressed and destroyed completely. But for a few microseconds, uh, it's feeling perfectly safe, and it's still entangled with the other electron, which is safely outside. Okay. So this is, and quantum mechanics says, they're still entangled. So there is some connection between the inside and outside of a black hole, which again, actually, was not possible in the theory of gravitation. Einstein theory of gravity said there's no connection. There's never any connection whatsoever. You know, there's no causal connection here, but there is some quantum correlation between the inside and outside of the black hole. Uh, and that pretty much helps us understand uh, why black holes have a temperature. Uh, because uh, if I am holding this electron in my hand, uh, so inside and outside are entangled. And then if I'm an observer sitting here outside a black hole, so Stephen Hawking has this electron uh, in his hand. Uh, so this, entangled, this electron is entangled with the other one. Uh, and so it's neither up nor down. But as a matter of principle, you know, even if some observer inside the black hole measures this electron, uh, it's never going to tell, be able to tell Stephen Hawking what's going on. That electron is gone forever. This is you know, this is the past the screen of any causality. So this electron is not really entangled with anything in our observable universe. Uh, so it's effectively random. Uh, and really, that's that's the answer. You have a random uh, electron, and randomness relates to entropy, as Boltzmann taught us. And then entropy, once you have entropy, you have temperature. Okay, so that connects up with the equations at the very beginning. So here's another picture of it. Just, so that was Hawking's brilliant realization that you could just sit outside a black hole. And just by thinking about processes outside a black hole, you could even, he actually even computed the entropy. Uh, it's this number here where A is the area of the horizon. So this is also a very bizarre answer because uh, any other uh, system at the finite temperature has an entropy that's proportional to its volume, but black holes are very special. They have an entropy proportional to the area. All right, so now to complete a full circle. So we have an entropy, and then you go back to Boltzmann. So Boltzmann taught us entropy is a measure of randomness. It's a measure of the count of the number of states available to a system. So this, so then there's a question, open question here. We have this collapsed black hole with all this matter in the center, uh, 
and that matter must be behaving quantum mechanically. So it must have a lot of states, uh, and those states must match uh, Hawking's calculation. Uh, so in this words, if you take the density of state, which is a measure of W, and this is now an exponential, it's the exponential of the entropy. So this is just the inverse of the formula, S equals K log W, uh, that's on Boltzmann grade stock. So can you actually compute this density of states? So that's been a central problem in black hole physics for quite a while. Uh, it's mostly open even today. But in certain simple situations, the answer is people have computed it. Uh, and most famously, Stromberg and Bach are computed it for uh, using string theory for a supersymmetric black hole. These are very special types of black holes uh, not found in our universe. Uh, but anyway, this is a simple model. And what they concluded was that there was indeed this density of states, uh, but all the states were exactly at zero energy. Uh, so there was what's called a delta function. They're all at zero energy, and there's exactly the right number of states uh, that we got from Hawking's. Uh, from the Boltzmann and Hawking answers. All right, uh, so where does the SYK model come in? Well, what the SYK model has allowed is to compute this for a much more general class of black holes. So you still take these charged black holes that Strom and Dan Rafa already took, but without the supersymmetry. Uh, and this is, oh, sorry, this is a couple of slides that are gonna get a little technical, but not too much, uh, and then I'll end. Uh, so if you zoom through, go to the horizon of a charged black hole, you find that you can pretty much ignore the angular uh, dependence of all the degrees of freedom. So you just need to write down a theory uh, in one space and one time dimension. So, so in that one space and one time dimension, the horizon is just a point. So there's some, in, you know, and Hawking told us that the entropy had to do with uh, entanglement uh, across the horizon. So I need lots of entanglement at one point. And what better way to do that but the SYK model? So it's as if this the SYK model sitting there, uh, and that's from the view of the outside observer, that's what's causing the entanglement. Uh, but in reality, you know, so, uh, in, I guess from the point of view of somebody inside the black hole, it's really at the center. Uh, anyway. Uh, so this gives us a way, actually, of calculating from a microscopic model the entropy of such a black hole. Uh, and so that's been done for the SYK model. You get this uh, strange expression as a function of energy of the density of quantum states. Uh, and using this result, uh, in the last couple of years, now we have a very complete expression for the density of states of a charged black hole in three space-time dimensions without supersymmetry three plus one space-time dimension. Uh, and various people contributed to this, including SMD. Uh, and the SYK model uh, really led to this understanding of this very specific factor uh, that appears in the density of states. This is the Hawking answer, Hawking-Boltzmann answer. And this is even more subtle than I won't say anything about. Uh, OK, so to conclude, and I think I'm ending on time, uh, so I told you about, if you remember anything else, just remember this. Uh, the idea of three of the, four of the greatest discoveries in physics. Uh, one is the understanding of the microscopic basis of entropy and the third and second law of thermodynamics. Superconductivity, of course, black holes. And these concepts are amazingly all linked together uh, in some very beautiful unified way uh, using quantum entanglement. Uh, and to beat my own horn a little bit, uh, so the SYK model uh, is really the, uh, a new type of model that's allowed us to really understand what happens when particles entangle so strongly that you can't even tell there are any particles. Particles just completely lose their identity. Uh, and in one set of variables, this has allowed us to understand the strange method of YBCO. And a different set of variables, in a dual set, as people sometimes say, uh, it's has allowed us to understand uh, the nature, many detailed aspects of the nature of quantum entanglement across a black hole horizon. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Professor Sajdev, for this wonderful public lecture. Um, so questions, I already see a lot of hands. So yeah, maybe we can start. That was a very interesting lecture. And what was re really interesting was that we heard of res uh, you know, resonance valence bonds in uh, in uh, benzene, and then now they're in here, and maybe they'll be in black holes somewhere. I don't know where they are. Yeah, well, I mean, um, it's, I think uh, the way to say it is they are, you know, quantum entanglement has many, many different patterns. The simplest pattern is benzene. Yeah. Uh, and then I there's- mean, That's the first time I heard this, and I'm excited <laughs> about hearing it. And then, you get more and more complicated patterns. And I believe one of the most complicated uh, is the SYK model. But anyway, oh, okay. there's a whole and continuum of states I between have, them. I <laughs> have two more questions. One is that um, the Ramanujan uh, partition uh, formula has some role to play in counting of the black hole states, right? Uh, or the the entanglement states. Uh, in, you're I, talking about Ramanujan's thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's... In, in the SYK model also? No, no. So that's okay. for if you take the super connect, the super symmetric solution I mentioned here very briefly. Uh, so this is the leading answer, e to the s. Now there's a coefficient there. Yeah. And for the super symmetric solution, if you want to even get that coefficient, and then some of Ramanujan's mathematical identities are extremely important there. So those those identities appear in everywhere. In some, well, they appear in the properties of modular functions and, and they appear yeah, very yeah. naturally in supersymmetric black holes. Uh, SYK is a bit too chaotic. It, you know, it's beautiful to me, but it's yeah. not as elegant and beautiful as supersymmetry. Uh, it's, more, it's a more chaotic system and it doesn't have Ramanujan, that, uh, connection to Ramanujan, at least that direct. Okay. okay. And okay. So, the, maybe, uh, uh, so yes. just to give a chance to the rest of the audience, maybe we can come back later. So maybe we go to a question there. Uh, thank you, sir, for the nice presentation. Uh, so, uh, for example, for the black hole. Yeah. So entanglement across black hole. So how can the electron outside black hole remains outside? And even if it remains in presence of such strong interaction, how can the yeah, right. Of course, if it was just hanging on its own, they'll both fall in. Uh, but I'm imagining a thought experiment where uh, I'm exerting all kinds of forces to do this experiment. Uh, as long as those forces don't disturb the spin of the electron, it's all fine. Now, in reality, what's happening uh, is is more like this. Uh, there are what are called quantum fluctuations. You know, uh, quantum mechanically, every now and then even in our vacuum, uh, electron-positron pairs are all the time forming and annihilating. They're, they're virtual quantum fluctuations. So those kinds of virtual quantum fluctuations can also happen in this way. And, when, and that's what Hawking computed, the effect of these virtual quantum fluctuations, and that allowed him to compute the entropy. So that was a very simplified picture, but that's a little closer to the truth. Okay, next question here, please. Question. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, these are related to charged black holes. So what binds this theory just to charged black holes and just not like why is there the charged uh, word? No, no, I'm just a physicist. Like okay, that's a very deep question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so of course, uh, the black holes in the center of our galaxy are not charged, and we'd love to understand neutral black holes. They're just a lot more complicated. Maybe some people will answer. <laughs> Why am I talking about charged black holes? Because there was a rotating black hole. Oh, yes. Thank you. Black hole speed of the universe. Oh, yes. All right. Thank you. I, yeah, so Sandeep has uh, absolutely. So Sandeep mentioned that I could have also said similar things thanks to Sandeep's work of rotating black holes. Thank you, Sandeep. <laughs> Okay, but to continue asking your question, what is simpler about charged black holes? It's really a question of simplicity. We all would love to solve problems for uh, It's this feature here. Oops. Okay. Uh, there you go. Yeah. Uh, 
Right. So like I said at some point that you could ignore this X direction. You only need to focus on the Z direction. Uh, and this is a very special feature of the Einstein's equations near a charged black hole uh, that the angular directions you know, separate from the radial directions. For an ordinary neutral black hole, like the one at the center of our galaxy, uh, that's not true. So then it becomes a much more complicated theory of quantum gravity in three space and one time dimensions rather than quantum gravity in one space and one time dimension. So it's a reduced dimensionality. Problem. The reduced dimensionality is what allowed the very explicit connection to the SYK model. And even as Sandeep said, for a rotating black hole, again, it's the same. There's a reduced dimensionality that simplifies the problem. Thank you. So there is no complete, now the, yeah, there is no complete solution uh, in three plus one dimension. That's really the hard problem for quantum gravity. But in lower dimensions, we've been able to check, you know, as far as we can see, everything works. There's no breakdown of quantum mechanics or gravity or anything. Just comes together very beautifully. Next question. Yeah, please. Hi, uh, I have two questions. Uh, one on the you talk, the superconductivity model. So when you are talking about these uh, coupled electrons, uh, I mean one yeah. would think that all the nearby next neighbor bond electron couplings would yeah. have similar use the probabilities. Yeah, While exactly. the longer bond ones would have dissimilar. So can you really assign completely random ones? And how do you? Uh... Again, such great questions. <laughs> this is what I gave in my more technical talk. So that is exactly the question we've been working on for the past five years. Uh, how do we go from this completely random uh, solution of entanglement to something more realistic, which is moving on a square lattice, but it's not completely random. There is some randomness, but not that much. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so read my latest papers. The answer is <laughs> we, okay. we can make progress and we think we have a solution to this linear resistivity problem. Okay. Uh, but it's not exactly the SYK model, but certainly the SYK model showed us the way to proceed. Okay. Uh, you know. Yeah, okay. the other yeah. question is the competitive advantage is all I'm saying. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I just had another question with the temperature in the black hole. I mean, it's probably more... So when you really talk of temperature from entropy, the yeah. the thermodynamic temperature is more the entropy of configurations, right? Yes. Uh, in this particular case, what what would you mean? I mean, in the sense that these are spins or what configurations are we talking about here? Yeah, so let me just bring that famous equation up. In fact, I, there was another equation I had in the previous version, but I deleted it because I thought it's too complicated. Uh, but now I realize I shouldn't have. Uh, so... The equation, Boltzmann, of course, was well before quantum mechanics. In fact, this was the 1870s, okay. even before the Planck experiment and so on, which is 1900. Uh, and he was talking about the hypothesis that the gas in this room is made up of molecules. Even that people didn't believe. Mm. Uh, and common study of the, the mechanics of the glass, the, grass, the gas and the molecules in the room using Newton's laws. He came up with this idea, entropy, that Clausius had invented from thermodynamics, was related to the log of the number of possibilities, the number of the density of the gas in this, average velocities and so on. Uh, so in quantum mechanics, that's W is replaced by the density of states, basically. So you have these quantum states, which are eigenstates of the energy or the Hamiltonian, and it's the density of states per unit interval. It bring, in fact, if anything, it just becomes a much more precise formula quantum mechanically, because even the normalization of W is not in doubt. Um, okay. On to the next question. Yes, please. Uh, thanks for the nice talk. Yeah. Uh, uh, I thought experiment related to the black holes. Uh, yeah. So the more modern interpreta interpretations of quantum mechanics are like uh, thinking of the quantum state as a, or, or it as a theory of information. And here, if we think about the spin inside a black hole where there is no hope of extracting any, any information, right. does this have implications on our, like the interpretations of quantum mechanics or something like that? Uh, can uh, you? Yeah, what you said is correct. I mean, you, we, 
call it the you can think of the Hawking entropy as uh, as the entanglement entropy from of the outside and inside of a black hole. Uh, does it have implications? Well, it doesn't change any of the classical interpretations of entropy, uh, but it gives us new situations in which we can compute it more microscopically where quantum mechanics is important. Uh, but it, yeah, what, what was the question again? What was the final? And I was just saying that allowing such a thought experiment, does it affect our interpretation of it as a theory of information? Uh, assistant with information theory, I mean, that's, it came from there. I mean, Boltzmann, I mean, the theory of information, I guess you put, Shannon, uh, he was very much influenced by Boltzmann. He was giving a, a more in certain different situations, uh, defining in, information. And so there are many other configuration, you know, types of information that people now talk about, uh, relative entropy, mutual information, entanglement entropy, and so on. Uh, and Boltzmann was just the original one of those. Yeah. There's no inconsistency, though. Thank you. Next question. Hello. Yeah. Uh, nice talk. Uh, so the Hawking temperature, which you sort of mentioned, uh, which you mentioned that came out of the calculation of area. So I think there are some similar arguments which uh, Propose that given a given a body accelerating will have an equivalent temperature. You technically don't need a black hole to have a to have a similar temperature. I think it's called the unrow radiation temperature. Yeah. Uh, so do these arguments apply in the same way? And if yes, then the horizon becomes a problem, right? Um. Uh, yeah. I don't really know enough about gravity to do it good answer to that. Uh, so that has to do with an accelerating observer. And, and so certainly entropy can depend upon who the observer is mm -hmm. because of where the horizons are. Uh, in this case, when I'm talking about the Hawking entropy, uh, I'm talking about an observer really far away from the black hole. So it's that observer sees this entropy. The that observer that is not accelerating, it's at rest and it sees that entropy. That's what I'm referring to. Uh, you know, an infalling observer wouldn't see anything at the horizon. So uh, I think, yeah, it's a, entropy is, you have to define exactly what temperature, frame of reference you're computing. Yeah, so, I mean, just sort of I was thinking as an extension, if this works for, works well for this theory, then technically the accelerated frame of reference derived temperature also might. Yeah, I mean, I, there is a lot of work these days on, the Sitter universe, which is an expanding universe, uh, and people, I see papers every now and then, yeah, people coming up with different definitions of what, what the entropy is. So, and I'm by no means an expert, but some of those people are even using the SYK model, so that's all I'm happy about. <laughs> Next question. Uh, okay, please. Okay. I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions, but it's... Sorry. I'm sorry I'm asking so many questions, but it's no very, very interesting. Thank you. Uh, so the one, uh, two questions I want to ask. One is that, have you looked at tripartite entanglement of these in this system? In, in which system? The black hole? Or no, no, uh, no. Your, uh, uh, the such they hit uh, and I haven't. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody has. Uh, there are a lot of people working on it. And uh, uh, does that give this uh, some sort of a uh, flavor of the multipartite entanglement that will be there ultimately? Uh, yes. I mean, even the ordinary bipartite also is rather anomalous. It's volume law rather than area law, for example. Uh -huh. uh, but I haven't studied the tripartite. I don't know. Yeah. And the second thing is, have has anybody talked of using this as uh, some sort of quantum computer? Uh, well, I... Yes, people not as a quantum computer, uh, but as a quantum core. Yeah. So the point is that it has very complicated eigenstates. Uh, so which means the which means that if you took some basis of states 
the SYK model and encoded something in those states, treat them as logical qubits, uh, then that's very immune to other perturbations. The only trouble is uh, it's an exponentially hard problem to actually know those what those states are. So in principle, it's a wonderful quantum code, yeah. but it's such a good quantum code that you can't decode really? it ever. <laughs> I thought the encryption would be great. <laughs> huh? so if, the encryption would you know, be great. If you could encode the information in it, uh, that information is really protected. But to get it out. At least we don't know how to get it out. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any further questions? Are there questions over Zoom? Maybe we can take a couple of questions there. Okay. Uh, I'll wait for maybe 30 seconds. If someone has a question, just maybe speak up <laughs> over Zoom. Okay. Well, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, if no, that's I... not the case, uh, then let's thank Professor Sajdev again for this wonderful talk and interaction.